Psalms. And over the course of the next two weeks, we're still in the book of Psalms, but I wanted to focus on the topic of trust for both of these next two weeks. We're going to begin by looking at a psalm which uh, is one of my favorites. It's one of the ones that I enjoy reading a lot, Psalm 121. And during these two weeks, we're going to answer two fundamental questions around the topic of trust. Today, we're going to attempt to answer the question, can I trust God? Can I trust Him? Next week, we're going to attempt to answer the question, will I trust God? The question, can I trust God, really points to God's trustworthiness. The question, will I trust God, speaks to our willingness to choose to trust God. Will we choose to trust Him? What is it about trusting God that we're going to spend two weeks on this topic? Let me give you a few reasons why I think this is important. And we've been looking at this over the last several weeks as well. Here's the first thing. Many of you know this, but the entire Christian life is built on trust. Think about it. We trust that God created everything out of nothing. We trust that God inspired man to write the Bible, and we believe that, that God, that's God's word. We trust that... Um, We trust that um, the Bible is God's word to us and the authority by which we're to live. We trust that God loved us so much that he sent his son, Jesus. We trust that when Jesus died on the cross, that God accepts Jesus' death as our substitute, and we are now sons and daughters of God. We trust that Jesus rose from the dead. We trust that the Holy Spirit lives inside of us as believers, and we trust that he empowers us to be and do all that God has called us to be and do. And we can go on and on and on. But the entire Christian faith is built on trust. The second thing, and this is huge, it is only when we learn to trust God that we will truly find rest. It's only when we trust that we will find rest. We're going to come back to this in a moment when we look at Psalm 121. But let me say a couple things. I think the word that describes a lot of us, especially as believers, is that we are restless people. We're always anxious, always busy, always doing things, restless. And one of the reasons I think this is true, especially for me, is that as much as I wish I was in control of my life, the reality is I'm not. And the reality is neither are you. And until we realize that, or better, the sooner we realize that, the better off we will be. Someone once described life as this huge curtain that is draped across your path It's a curtain that recedes as you advance, but only one step at a time. That's a great description of life, but it's also a biblical description of life. Proverbs 21, 7 says, we don't know what a day will bring to us. You and I have no idea what's going to happen to us today. You and I have no idea where we're going to be tomorrow. You and I have no idea what's going to happen with our future. We have no knowledge, and we have no control over it, but we can know the one who does. And we can know the one who has control over our lives. In fact, in Scripture, the one thing that you will find is trusting and resting are inseparable. Because when the Bible talks about rest, it is always in the context of trusting God. That's why David in Psalm 62, he says, Turn your heart to God. Pour your heart out to God, for he is a refuge to us. That word refuge literally means a place of retreat or a place of rest. It is only when we learn to trust God that we can fully rest. I don't want to speak for anyone else, but as a, for a guy that struggles with restlessness, with a guy that struggles with sitting and doing nothing, I need to be reminded that all of this goes back to trust. It always goes back to that. And here's the third thing. Very practical, but very hard and very honest. Trusting God is one of the hardest things that we could do. It's incredibly hard. It's hard to trust him. I'm 36. I know I look a lot younger than that. I've been pastoring for about 10 years now, so I, and a student of God's word even longer than that. I grew up in the house of a pastor, so the Bible was constantly drilled into our heads. I can quote chapter and verse that teaches that God is good. I can quote chapter and verse that teaches that God is in control. I can quote chapter and verse that teaches that God cares for us. But I'm smart enough to know, I'm smart enough to know that there's a major difference between preaching about trust and actually practicing trust. There's a major difference between counseling someone to trust God and actually trusting God myself. I understand that, but however, this is so important for us to get 
as difficult as it is to trust God, one of the things that makes it easier for us to trust God is when we have an accurate view of the God that we're called to trust. That's why A.W. Tozer nails it right on the head when he says, what comes to mind when we think about God is the most important thing about you. That's so true. What comes to mind when you and I think about God, our view of God, it changes, it affects everything. So it's only natural when we start talking about trusting God, we begin by asking and answering the question, can we trust God? Can I trust God? Can you trust God? The Psalm 121 actually answers this question for us beautifully. And as we transition to Psalm 121, let me make this statement that is the premise of everything that I'm building this sermon on. If there is a single event that occurs in our lives outside of God's sovereign control, then we can't trust God. If there is one event in our life, one thing, anything in our lives that happens outside of God's control, then we can't trust Him. If there is If there's one thing that falls outside of his scope, if there's something that surprises him, if there's anything that catches God off guard, listen, we can't trust him. We might as well shut down and live our lives the way we want to live it. If there's one thing that falls outside of his view, all of this isn't pointless. We can't trust him. So what we're really doing this morning is we're asking and answering the question, can I trust God? What we're really doing is spending time talking and embracing the sovereignty of God in our lives. We're really asking the question, is God in control of our lives? So that brings us to our psalm. And let me read it, and I want you to read along with me. Um, Psalm 121, verse 1. It should be behind us, I believe. Right? Okay. Number one, verse 1. I lift my eyes to the hills. Where does my help come from? My help comes from the Lord who made the heaven and the earth. He will not let your foot be moved. He who keeps over you will not slumber. Behold, he who keeps Israel will neither slumber nor sleep. The Lord is your keeper. The Lord is your shade at your right hand. The sun shall not strike you by day, nor the moon by night. The Lord will keep you from all evil. He will keep your life. The Lord will keep your going out and your coming in from this time forth and forevermore. This psalm, the 121st psalm is... One of 15 psalms known as the Psalm of Ascent, the psalm that we looked at last week, is also one of those psalms. Basically what that means is this is a psalm that the Jews would sing as they were journeying to Jerusalem for their annual festivals or times of celebration. Anytime a Jew would ascend a mountain to go to Jerusalem for worship, they had a sense of anticipation, but there's also a sense of trepidation. There was anticipation because they were going into the presence of God. They were going to enjoy God's grace. They were going to enjoy God's forgiveness. They were going to enjoy God's love. They were going to be in Jerusalem, the city of God. There was anticipation that God was going to do something in their lives when they went to Jerusalem. But as they traveled their mountain, there was also a sense of trepidation. There was a sense of fear. As they traveled, anything could happen to them. They could fall. They could get hurt. They could be attacked by the wild animals in the mountain. They could be robbed and beaten or even killed by the bandits that hid in the mountains. Therefore, even though going to Jerusalem was filled with anticipation, it was also filled with trepidation. So when we look at verse 1, I lift my eyes to the hills. That's where we're going. Where does my help come from? The psalmist is sure of his destination. He knows where he's supposed to go. He's just a little unsure of the trip getting there. So he acknowledges and he understands that he needs help in his life. We have this tradition in our family that was passed on from my parents that anytime we go on a long trip, um, not a trip to Walmart or anything, because um, uh, we pray when we get to Walmart, but anytime we go on a long trip, we pray before we go. Walmart, we, when we get there, we just see people and we start praying. There's some weird people at Walmart. Um, but if we're traveling somewhere long distance, we we pray before we get in the car, we stand by the door and we say, God, we know where our destination is, but before we get there, we don't know what's going to happen between where we are and where we're going to end, so would you be with us? We acknowledge God's presence and protection over our lives. That's what the psalmist is doing. He's saying, God, I know where I'm headed. I'm going to Jerusalem, but on the way there, I don't know what could happen to me. 
I don't know if there's going to be bandits. I don't know if there's going to be wild animals. I don't know if I could fall and get hurt. But as I journey there, would you protect me? Would you watch over me? The acknowledgement of saying, God, my life is in your hands. You've got to take care of me. We know our destination, but we're unsure of the trip. So we ask God to go with us. And that's what the psalmist does. Verse 2, my help comes from the Lord who made heaven and earth. I've already mentioned this, but the psalmist answers the question, can I trust God? And the reason I think the psalmist answers that question is because this psalm teaches us several things about God and who God is. So we walk through this chapter. I want to point out three specific things that it says about God. And the first thing is this. One of the reasons that we can trust God with our lives is because God is the creator. Therefore, nothing is too big for him. Verse 2, my help comes from the Lord, the maker of heaven and earth. There are two truths that are mentioned in verse 2 that speaks volumes of who God is. They are actually fundamental, foundational truths of our lives. God is personal. God is powerful. He is personal. He is powerful. My help comes from the Lord. The word there is Yahweh. The, it's the, not only the word for the most holy name of God, but it's the word for the most personal name of God. And it points to the fact that God loves his people, God wants a relationship with his people, and God wants to be involved in the lives of his people. There's a common and growing view of God today. It's growing. It's been around for centuries, but it's incredibly increasing today that acknowledges that God created the universe and God created us, but once he created us, he takes a step back and leaves us on our own. But it says that God, now we're left to ourselves, and the only time that God gets involved is either to judge or to punish. Listen, that's a totally wrong view of God. It's an unbiblical view of God. Because when you read the Bible, the Bible says that God wants a relationship. God loves you. God wants to be involved with your life. That's why he sends Jesus to the world, because he wants to be personal with you. God is a personal God. But the second aspect of it is he's a powerful God. My hope comes from the Lord who made the heaven and the earth. Don't miss this. The God who created everything out of nothing, the God of Genesis 1 and Genesis 2, is the God that wants to help you. He is not just personal, but he is powerful. In this one verse, it points to God's willingness to help. He's personal, but it also speaks to his ability to help. He is powerful. He is personal. He's powerful. Because he is creator, there is nothing too big for him. There is nothing in this world that could, the world could throw at you or throw at me that is too big for God. Some of you need to hear that this morning because a lot of us, we have no problem trusting God for our eternal life, but we have a huge problem trusting God for our daily life. We do. We know that God will take us to heaven, but we don't trust that he could provide for our daily needs. But you can't separate the two. If God's got your eternity... He's also got your today. You can trust him. One of the reasons that we struggle with that is because in our eyes, God is not as big as he is today as he is in the pages of scripture. And we got to remind ourselves over and over and over and over again that the God who helps is the God who creates. Therefore, nothing is too big for him. A few chapters down in Psalm 124, David writes the exact same thing. Our help is in the name of the Lord who made heaven and earth personal, powerful. He is the creator, therefore nothing is too big for him. Before we leave these first two verses, I want to point out one more thing that's a kind of a side note, but notice that these two verses are the only verses in the entire psalm that's spoken in the first person. In other words, the psalmist is talking to himself here. He's preaching him to himself. I lift up my eyes to the hills. Where does my hope come from? My hope comes from the Lord, the maker of heaven and earth. He's very personal. He's speaking to himself. I forgot who said it, but someone once said, a lot of our unhappiness in life is a direct result of us listening to ourselves instead of preaching to ourselves. I think that's so true. Some of us need to be talking to ourselves a lot more than we listen to ourselves. Because the enemy will fill our minds with nonsense about God, but we have the option to speak the truths and promises of God and remind ourselves that God is powerful, God is personal, God is willing, God is able. He is strong enough to help me. For some of us, one of the things that we need to keep telling ourselves over and over and over again is that God is the creator, therefore nothing is too big for him. Here's another observation from this passage. The second thing that the text teaches us God never sleeps. 
Therefore, nothing surprises him. Look at verse 3 and verse 4. He will not let your foot be moved. He who keeps you will not slumber. Behold, he who keeps Israel will neither slumber nor sleep. The word keeps that's used in verse 3 is a word that's used six times in this passage, in this chapter. It's actually a word that is used to reference God watching over us, caring for us, protecting us. In other passages, it describes like an eyelid that's the guardian of our eye. Great picture or imagery of God. That's why the psalmist can say in verse 3, he will not let your foot be moved. Listen, it doesn't mean that there are times in your life where, you're going to experience, where you won't experience hardship or trouble or difficulties because the reality is you will. Please don't read this text and think that this is a promise that life will be perfect, that you'll be walking through a garden without any trouble at all. And over the past several weeks, we've been looking at Psalms where the psalmist is crying out to God for help in the midst of trouble, in the midst of difficulty. But what this verse means is that no matter what we encounter, God never takes his eyes off of us. No matter what we go through in life, God's eyes are constantly on us. He never lets go of our hands, and he is always, always, always satisfying and sustaining us. We're going to come back to this in verse 7 because it's developed there a little bit more, but look at why we can trust God. The second part of verse 3, he who keeps you will never slumber. Translation, God never dozes off. Whereas you and I, we can't survive without sleep. We can't make it and do the things we're supposed to do if we don't rest. We can't do our jobs if we don't get a good night's rest. We can't get a good education if we don't get the rest that we need. Need. We also couldn't make it if God rested. If God dozed off, we couldn't make it. Think about it. If God had to take a 15-second power nap, our life would be a mess. If God's eyes weren't on us for a minute, we would be a disaster. The reason that you and I can rest, the reason that you and I can put our heads down every night and sleep is because there's a God who never sleeps. It's because there's a God who's watching over us every step of the way. God never does. He's always awake. He's always watching over us. His eyes are always open. He never takes a day off. He never gets tired. He never needs a vacation. He never takes a nap. Therefore, you and I can because God never does. On a side note, let me say this quickly. This is the, really, the primary principle behind the idea of Sabbath, the rest. This is the primary reason that you and I can take a day off and we can enjoy Sabbath because God never does. In fact, by resting and taking a day off, we are affirming to a world that we trust God's sovereignty. You know, for me personally, as much as I know this and believe this, it's still hard for me to slow down and take a day off. You know why? Because in my mind, it's all up to me. It's all about what I do and how I do it. That if I don't do it, it won't get done. Newsflash, it's not up to me. It's not up to you. God has been bringing me back constantly to Psalm 127, a few chapters down this year that says, unless the Lord builds the house, those who build it labor in vain. Unless the Lord watches over the city, the watchmen stay in, awake in vain. Verse 2 of Psalm 127 says, it is in vain that you rise up early, and it's in vain that you go to bed late to rest, eating the bread of anxious toil, for he gives to his beloved rest. We can rest because God never does. And to drive this point home, the psalmist gives an example in verse 4. He says, behold, he who keeps over Israel will neither slumber nor sleep. Another side note, anytime you see the word behold in scripture, it always means pay attention to this. This is important. Listen, it's a word that's used to draw the reader's attention. It's kind of us parents that says, hey, pay attention to this. Like, don't run into the street. This is important. You need to know this. That's what Psalmist is saying. Listen, even if you miss everything else, get this. God is watching over you. God is taking care of you. His eyes are on you. It's important. The writer says, behold, this could save your life. It could save a lot of heartaches in your life. Behold, he who watches over Israel will never sleep. The combination of slumbering nor sleeping means he's never caught off guard. He will, you will never hear God say, how did I miss that? You will never hear God say, 
How did that slip past me? You will never hear God say, I never saw that coming. You'll never hear him say that because nothing catches him off guard. Nothing surprises him. There's no better example than the people of God, Israel. Despite all of the heartache, the pain, the struggles that they've gone through, God kept them. He's always watched over them, and he's never slept. And the same is true of you. The same is true of me. The reason we're sitting here this morning is because we have a God whose eyes are on us, and he never takes his eyes off of us. Many of you here today are restless. You're anxious, and the chances of that is reality. in reality, it's a trust issue. You don't trust God with your life. It's where you find yourself, what you need to do, what I need to do is step back and remind ourselves, I don't have to worry. I don't have to be anxious. I don't have to be restless because I can trust God. Even when I go close my eyes and sleep, he is working on my behalf. His eyes are on me. Therefore, I don't have to worry. There's a third thing that the Psalms teaches us about God. It says, God is always at our side. Therefore, nothing will touch us unless God allows it. Verses 5 through 7. The Lord is your keeper. The Lord is your shade at your right hand. The sun shall not strike you by day nor the moon by night. The Lord will keep you from all evil. He will keep your life. This is my favorite part of this psalm. One of the things that God has taught me over my Christian life, and one of the things that I keep needing to be reminded over and over again is the reality is that I can endure anything. I can endure anything that life throws at me if I know that God is in it and that God is with me. That's what this passage speaks to. Look at verse 5. The Lord is your keeper. The Lord is the shade at your right hand. What a great imagery here. A shade at your right hand. God is your shade at your right hand. Think about it. For something to provide shade, it has to be big, and it also has to be close. God is your shade. He's big. He's close. He's right by you. And the phrase right hand, when it's used biblically, it always speaks of strength and favor. The right hand was a place that was reserved for the warrior or the champion or the savior. To sit at someone's right hand was symbolic of being very close, some as being indispensable, and being useful for that person. That's a powerful imagery. This is a picture of God. God is a shade at your right hand. He's saying not only is God big, not only is God close, not only is your Savior, but he's the one who fights for you. God fights for you. God fights for me. This speaks not only to the fact that God is personal and powerful, It speaks to the fact that he's present with us. He's always with us. Psalm 16, verse 8. Because God is my right hand, I will not be shaken. Romans 8. If God is for us, who can be against us? Listen, God's presence with you, God's presence with me, that's a game changer. That changes everything. Because not only does it tell us that we're never alone, but it also speaks to the reality that nothing can happen to us, nothing can touch us, nothing can affect us unless God allows it. This is verse, where verses 6 and 7 comes in. The sun shall not strike you by day, nor the moon by night. Does this mean that a guy who's traveling to Jerusalem by the heat of the day, that he won't get a sunburn or not a sunstroke? That's not what he's saying at all. Does it mean that he's not going to get attacked at night? That's not what the psalmist is saying. Instead, what this passage is saying, it's a metaphor that the psalmist is saying that because God is at your side, because God walks with you, you've got nothing to fear, day or night. It's a promise. It's not a promise of the absence of trouble. It's a promise of God's presence, even in the midst of trouble. Psalms 46.1, God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble. Psalm 23, verse 4, even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. Why? Not because I've got a good armor around me. Why? Because you are with me. Your rod, your staff, they comfort me. See, it's a promise of God's presence in our lives. It's also a promise that nothing can touch us unless God allows it. 
See, this is where we have to settle in our mind, especially as followers of Jesus, that God is sovereign over everything or he isn't sovereign over anything. He's either sovereign over every issue of your life or he's not sovereign over anything in your life. Either things happen to us apart from God knowing it and apart from God allowing it, or God knows it and allows it because he's got a greater purpose behind it. This is a thread that runs throughout Scripture continuously on every page. Nothing can happen to you. Nothing can happen to me unless God allows it. Does that include a loss of a job? Yes, it does. Does that include being hurt by a friend? Yes, it does. Does that even include a bad report about your health? Yes, it does. Does that include the death of a loved one? Yes, it does. Nothing can happen to you. Nothing can happen to me unless God allows it. Let me be the first to admit, that's a hard pill to swallow sometimes. It really is. But if we believe that the Bible teaches that God is good, that God is sovereign, that he uses all things to make us more like Jesus, not just to make us happy. If we believe that, then we can trust him that if he allows it, he has a purpose behind it, a purpose for our good, which is to become more like Jesus, and a purpose for his glory, that somehow or another he will be glorified in it. Proverbs 21.30, it's a humbling verse. It says, no wisdom, no understanding, no counsel, can succeed against God. He says, you're not smart enough to outdo God. Think about those words. There's no plan of man. There's no plan of anyone or anything. There is no insight. There is no wisdom that can succeed against God. Nothing. In fact, let's take it one step further. There is no wisdom. There is no insight. There is no plan that can separate us from God's presence. That's what the psalmist is really saying. They can scheme, they can plan, but you're in his hands. Verse 7, the Lord will keep you from all evil. He will keep your life. Literally, he will keep your soul. I love what this says about God. It says that God has me, God has you in such a way that there is nothing, there's no one that can ever pull us out of his hands and move us away from his presence. It speaks to God's willingness and his ability to preserve us all the way to the end. Listen, what God started in you, he's going to finish because he's faithful. Even when we are unfaithful, he remains faithful. He is going to bring it to completion. So if you're currently struggling, if you're wrestling, if you're wondering where God is in your life, please hear this. God has not forgotten you. God has not left you. God hasn't got too busy for you. Hang in there. Keep trusting. He's got you in the palm of his hands. Jesus says it in John chapter 10, one of my favorite passages in scripture. I give them eternal life. They will never perish and no one will snatch them out of my hands. No one. Jesus said that. God said that. If you're in his hands, there is not a scheme of the enemy that can take you from him. You are in the hands of God. If you have a relationship with God this morning, through Jesus, you can rest knowing that God has got you in his hands. That means that you can trust him. That means that I can trust him. That brings us to the last verse, verse 8. The Lord will keep your going out and your coming in from this time forward and forevermore. The phrase going out and coming in is a figure of speech that consists of the reality of all that you do. It's your entire life. The psalmist closes by reminding us that wherever you go, whatever you do from now until eternity, you have a dependable, a reliable, a trustworthy God by your side. A God who is not a, st- who, a God is a creator, so there's nothing too big for him. A God who never sleeps. So nothing surprises him. A God who's always by your side. Therefore, nothing will happen unless God allows it. I began this message by saying that if there's a single event, just one, that happens outside of God's sovereign control in my life, then we can't trust him. If there's one thing that happens that catches God by surprise, we can't trust him. That's how I started. Here's how I want to end. After walking through this psalm and hearing 
what it teaches us about God, that God is big, so nothing is too big for him. God never sleeps, so nothing surprises him, that God's always by our side, so nothing will happen to us unless he allows it. After hearing that, I'm confident that there is not a single event, not one, that will occur outside of God's sovereign control. Therefore, I can trust him with my life. Therefore, you can trust him with your life. Listen, the greatest evidence that we have a God who is reliable, dependable, is the cross. When we tried everything humanly possible to earn favor with God, when we in no way had an opportunity to get to heaven, God proved himself. He said, I'm going to become human. I'm going to live the life that they should have lived. I'm going to die the death that they should have died so that they can now be the sons and daughters of God. The greatest evidence that you can trust God is symbol symbolized at that table. That when we partake of the bread and we partake of the juice, we remind ourselves that we serve a trustworthy God. We serve a God who, while we were yet sinners, saved us. He did the greatest thing. I mean, there's nothing we could do to get out of hell. God did that. He redeemed us. He rescued us. If he can take care of our eternity, he can take care of our present. Listen, some of you this morning need to be reminded that God is the one who takes care of you. He never sleeps. His eyes are on you. He's so big, there's nothing too big for him. He's always by your side. This morning as we come to the table, you need to be reminded there's a God that's reliable, dependable, trustworthy. No matter what you're going through in life this morning, you need to be reminded that he is good, that he is faithful. So I'm going to invite you to examine your heart. I'm going to invite you to examine your life and see, do you really trust God? Do you trust him with your life? Hopefully through this passage, you could see that he is worthy of your trust, that he is worthy of of you putting your life in his hands and knowing he's got the best for you. But do you trust him? Do you trust him with your finances? You college guys, do you trust him with your future that he will provide a job for you when you finish? Do you trust him that he will take care of your daily needs? Do you trust that he'll take care of your family? See, this is not just an issue for those struggling. This is an issue for those of us who think we have our life in order, that think that we have good jobs, we have good families, and all of our trust and confidence is in what we have. All of that can be gone in an instant. And God says, no, even if they're gone, I'm still here. Even if your job is gone, I'm right here with you. Even if your health fails, I'm still here with you. Even if disaster happens, I've got your back. So this morning, I'm going to invite you to examine your heart. Only you know it. I don't. What areas of your life are you struggling to trust God in? What areas of your life are you struggling to say, God, I know that you have what's best for me. That if I am your child, the promise is that you will be with me every step of the way. That you'll take care of me. What areas are you struggling in? And would you, if you need to, repent? And I'm going to invite you to come to the table and grab the elements. Whenever you're ready, you, the way we do communion here is you come to the table, you grab the elements, come back to your seat. And I'll come at the end and we'll partake together. But whenever you are ready, you're welcome to come and grab the, the juice and the bread, come back to your table, and come back to your seat. And we'll worship together. Let's worship. Father, this morning as we have examined the scripture, I pray that your Holy Spirit will convict us. If there's any area of our life that we don't trust you, this morning, would you bring us to a point of repentance? If there's anything that we think that is outside of your scope, would you convict us of that? If there's any area where we are overstressing because we don't trust you, oh 
over worrying because we don't believe that you'll do work, would you help us to repent this morning? You have proved yourself trustworthy in the past, and we know that you will prove yourself over and over and over again. We love you. It's in Jesus' name.